Okay, let's get started. So I'm Joanne Sweezy. I'm uh, co-leader of uh, the Radiobiology and Radiotherapy Program of the Yale Cancer Center and also Associate Director for Basic Sciences. And today we have uh, two members of the Radiobiology and Radiotherapy Program to give talks. And so the first is Jung Yoon, and he's going to talk about tumor hypoxia and a regulation of cancer, uh, uh, stem, cancer cell stemness. Jung? Thank you, Joanne, and it's a great pleasure uh, 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 to speak here today. Uh, I've been a regular member in the audience, but today we switch chairs, and I uh, uh, really appreciate this opportunity to share with you uh, what has been going on uh, uh, in our neck of the woods. All right, as you uh, title see, uh, we've been uh, very uh, interested in tumor microenvironment, especially the hypoxic tumor microenvironment, and we're trying to understand why hypoxia is important, you know, why hypoxia uh, promotes tumor progression, uh, induce therapy resistance, and uh, uh, from uh, the cell fate uh, uh, perspective. All right, first of all, I, I'd like to, you know, have to make this uh, disclosure, uh, but most importantly, I want to make this uh, uh, statement. And nearly solid uh, uh, hypoxia is a common feature in all solid tumors. And especially in a more aggressive or late stage cancers, uh, it is almost 100% uh, that you're going to see some level of hypoxia within solid tumors. And by definition, it's a, uh, with the oxygen concentration or partial pressure of less than 15 millimeter mercury or 2% uh, oxygen. I'll, I'll talk about it later. All right, so for those of you who are not very familiar with hypoxia, we're going to start with this to talk about the uh, oxygen in the air as, as well as uh, in our circulation. So in the air, at, uh, in the air we breathe, uh, it contains about 21% uh, oxygen. And uh, in the blood that leaves the lung, it contains oxygen roughly over 10%. And the, uh, the, in the blood retaining to the lung, the oxygen uh, partial pressure drops to uh, about two per, uh, five percent. In the tissue, uh, for most in most part, the tissue oxygen concentration is uh, most likely to be above uh, twenty five millimeter mercury, or roughly about like three point two percent. In contrast, in most solid tumors. Uh, that have measured, uh, 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 assessed directly with uh, oxygen electrodes, the oxygen partial pressure, the median uh, uh, PO2, is about 10 millimercury or about 1.2% oxygen. So for all intent and purposes, hypoxia is defined as a condition, pathologic condition, when the oxygen partial pressure drops below 15 millimeter mercury, or roughly about 2%. Uh, there's a, the, bio, the, the biologic fund, uh, uh, basis for this definition is, is based on the activation of the hy classical hypoxia activity signaling transduction. All right, uh, this is a study just published uh, earlier this year. This, this is a group of people uh, look at the uh, uh, a number of uh, common tumors in the clinics and assess their degree of hypoxia using a set of uh, uh, surrogate hypoxia markers. The point I'm to make is that, as you can see from uh, the axis, each one indicates a different type of tumor, and there's a great variation uh, from tumor to tumor in terms of their potential hypoxia contents. Or, 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 or a, a, another important point is that, as a, some of the uh, vertical lines show you, there's a great heterogeneity or variability from one tumor to another within the same category. Uh, for example, this is, a, uh, this, uh, this is the pancreatic cancer, and the breast cancer is next to it. So, so again, there, there's a great variability uh, in, term of, in the degree of hypoxia, in a percent hypoxia from tumor type to tumor type, uh, as well as uh, from individual tumor to individual tumor within each tumor type. And this is a, a good example to show the 
intracellular heterogeneity of, uh, of hypoxia that are often found in solid tumors. And this is a uh, pigment staining indicates where uh, the hypoxia regions are, and this is a uh, uh, radiography uh, uh, image you know, of the same thing. And you can see that uh, it, it happens uh, in a tumor, uh, but it happens uh, uh, in a random fashion. And, and we have uh, developed a mouse model that has a capacity to uh, identify hypoxic tumor cells in, uh, uh, in situ. And using this method, we, found, uh, we did the two photon uh, analysis and trying to understand the uh, spatial distribution of hypoxic regions within a live uh, or sol uh, solid tumor. Uh, in this uh, uh, MMTV mouse memory tumor model, as you can see, uh, there, the green uh, indicates uh, the labeled presumably hypoxic tumor cells uh, at the uh, uh, region uh, from, say, their start point to about 80 micron. And the arrows indicate uh, where the blood vessels are. And I want to start from the uh, right side. As you can see, this, uh, when these uh, uh, vessels are visible, apparently are functional, and you see uh, very little uh, uh, green cells indicating this area is a well uh, perfused, well oxygenated. On the far left side, and when the vessels are barely uh, visible, and then you see, uh, start to see a, a large area of uh, uh, green cells popping out, indicating this area is a poorly perfused, and, uh, and uh, these cells are most likely to be a, a hypoxia. Again, uh, so these two examples, and demonst uh, clear demonstrate the nature of uh, heterogeneous nature of tumor hypoxia within solid tumors, uh, either uh, winning a, uh, at a certain uh, cross section as well as uh, vertically uh, in a Z uh, axis. All right. So the question is, uh, why do we care about uh, tumor hypoxia? Back in the fifties, uh, uh, hy hypoxia has been well established and well recognized by radiobiologists as a significant resistance to radiation therapy. In the absence of oxygen, actually work very poorly compared to uh, when the cells are maintained or maintained at a, a well oxygen concentration. And uh, after several decades of uh, active research, and we start to understand much more about the nature of hypoxia as most important, the biological uh, uh, nature of tumor cells uh, in the hypoxia region. And the fundamental findings are the hypoxic tumor cells are intrinsically more aggressive and are intrinsically more resistant to radiation therapy. As this example show that uh, if you uh, use the, this is the binary uh, uh, definition to call it a tumor with uh, less than 10 million mercury as hypoxia, and uh, there's a clearly there's a, uh, uh, a so clear association with poor regional control as well as uh, uh, poor overall uh, uh, patient survival. And uh, uh, another important point to make is that hypoxia is not a binary concept. It's uh, actually depend on the degree of oxygen or concentration of oxygen uh, in the tissue there's a different set of biology that happens in the tumor cells uh, 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 accordingly. And as I mentioned that uh, uh, in a radiobiology sense, the hypoxia occurs at the extreme end of the low oxygen spectrum <coughs> where uh, radio, radio resistance or surface resistance is lar largely due to the lack of oxygen to fix the DNA, uh, damage, uh, damaged DNA that is either caused, by, uh, caused either by radiation or some other uh, DNA damaging agents. And uh, uh, studies from uh, Peter Glazer's la uh, lab, uh, the chair of our department, uh, over the years has demonstrated that a number of DNA repair genes are significantly downregulated uh, at a low end of the uh, ox uh, hypoxia spectrum. And uh, over to the right, when the oxygen level is high enough not to cause severe uh, cell stress, and there's a, a different set of biology that happens within tumor cells, and either through uh, changes in autophagy, uh, uh, epigenetic regulation, 
uh, as well as uh, uh, crump, uh, crumping uh, 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 genome in, uh, instability. Uh, uh, in those different events will also, uh, can also lead to the therapy response, whether it's a radio res uh, sensitivity or sensitivity to radiation uh, uh, to other uh, chemotherapeutic uh, agents. And uh, we have been taking a slightly different perspective to understand the hypoxic tumor cells that are localized more in the uh, moderate or pathologic hypoxic region and to understand how they progress and how they uh, respond to uh, a therapy. All right, so this is the, one of the models that we have uh, uh, to identify hypoxic tumor cells in, in situ or in vivo. And uh, here we, we take advantage of a uh, GFP that, that is sensitive to hypoxia. And uh, uh, this is an uh, independent hypoxia marker, and you see the, the, uh, there's great uh, uh, co-localization uh, in the same area. And uh, uh, so we're interested in cell fate, and uh, the most important cell fate uh, of cancer cells, uh, as we know, is the stem cell-like characteristics. And for that, they, they have been a number of uh, uh, markers that have been applied uh, in the field to address the cell fate uh, or or stem cell uh, characteristics, uh, either in solid tumors or uh, associated with other type of tumors. And we use the uh, combination of uh, different uh, markers trying to uh, understand the cell fate decision uh, in the uh, hypoxic tumor marking environment in vivo. And this is one of the examples. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, this is the autotopic xenograph uh, fr uh, from human uh, basal-like uh, breast cancer. And when we sort them based on the GFP expression into a GFP positive, as the hypoxia uh, compartment, and compare it directly to the tumor cells uh, isolated uh, from the same, you know, same, uh, same tumor, but characterized as a non-hypoxia. And you see that there's a, there's a great difference uh, in the, uh, uh, the CD24 uh, positive uh, fraction. And there's a significant reduction in the CD24 uh, uh, positive fr uh, fraction in the hypoxia uh, domain. And this is a quantitation to show oh, I think I lost the, uh, hmm? the there's a great reduction in the uh, uh, CD24 uh, positive fraction and an increase in the CD44 and the CD uh, high and the CD24 low uh, population. And uh, uh, important uh, uh, to, remar uh, to uh, remember that we, the cell fate change that we found in vivo is not observed when, uh, when, we, just, uh, when we simply put the cells in a hypoxia chamber. It suggests that hypoxia, low oxygen alone does not cause the re, uh, uh, reshaping of the cell fate uh, in, the, in the cancer cells. It is the complex hypoxic microenvironment, which means low oxygen plus other things that drive the uh, uh, phenotypic uh, uh, change in, in, in a tumor. And this is just another thing, I'll, I'll just skip that. Uh, you know, with, with uh, uh, a basal-like uh, human breast cancer cells, we essentially found a similar uh, uh, observation. In this case, there's a significant uh, increase in the CD44 positive uh, population of this uh, basal-like MCF7 cells in the hypoxic uh, compartment where, uh, in the uh, xenografts. And uh, there are different, another marker to show. And like that. Okay. Uh, but that's just a phenotypic analysis. We, in collaboration with Dr. Ron Fan's lab uh, over across the, uh, from the outside of the campus, we uh, uh, did a single cell analysis and trying to understand the cell feed decision or, or, or uh, uh, at a single cell level, as you can see in this uh, summary slide, that the cells isolated from the hypoxic microenvironment are diagonally separated from the cells isolated from the non-hypoxic uh, compartment from the same tumor. So there's a clear uh, uh, difference in their uh, cell fit uh, commitment. All right. So, but that's just a phenotype. There, there, there's a uh, uh, a number of uh, 
biological assays to assess uh, the stem cell characteristics, namely the uh, self renewal potential, tumorigenic potential. We went through that. I, I'm, I'm not going to go through this data. Just to, to, uh, just to summarize that, the hypoxic uh, tumor cells I, I isolated ex vivo from the hypoxic microenvironment have increased self renewal potential as well as increased tumorigenic potential when we re inject it back into the uh, uh, xenografts, uh, into the uh, mutant mice. All right, so we're going to take a few minutes to talk about uh, uh, CD44 a little bit. This is from our recent work. And CD44 has been associated with uh, uh, stem cells and, and some other uh, 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 progenitor cells uh, uh, in, in, uh, in different tissue. And CD44 is, is, is an almost ancient molecule, but it plays a very important role in mediating communications across cell membrane. In other words, CD44 play a very important uh, function in tumor cell adaptation to different microenvironments through interactions with different uh, uh, extracellular uh, matrices and other proteins. And what we found was, and so uh, is our thing, under hypoxic conditions, hypoxia is sufficient to drive the cleavage of uh, uh, CD44 thus activating the pathway without the conventional or classical engagement uh, through uh, extracellular matrices. Uh, and so this cleavage is sensitive to, uh, is likely to be mediated by uh, proteases. As we, we see here, we use uh, two different kind of uh, uh, protease inhibitors, Mernostat as well as uh, uh, another one called NGH, so we can effectively block uh, CD44 cleavage under hypoxic, uh, under hypoxic conditions. Uh, but their hypoxia certainly in induces a wide range of, uh, a, number, a large number of uh, uh, proteins, uh, uh, as shown you on this uh, slide, but to uh, uh, make the long story short, and we found that the MM MMP1 is most likely to be uh, required for hypoxia-induced cleavage of CD44 uh, as shown by the two uh, independent uh, shRNA uh, uh, knockdown experiments. All right, so the cytoplasmic domain of CD4 certainly play an important role. Otherwise, uh, uh, we will not be able to, uh, you know, there will, there will be no reason for such a uh, significant increase in this cleavage under hypoxic conditions. So we would have had made a, uh, uh, a con expression construct a, uh, either with the entire uh, cytoplasmic domain. And the red ones indicated the nuclear localization domain, as, uh, as well as another one without the uh, nuclear localization capacity. And just to show you uh, 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 one uh, experiment that, that we did uh, with Sebastian uh, uh, in Dr. Pelizer lab, and we found that, as you can see, under normoxic conditions, the, the full set of plus domain were able to induce the base uh, hypoxia uh, sensing pathway uh, but not the uh, uh, cytoplasm without the uh, nuclear localization signal. And uh, uh, we, we saw similar things under hypoxia as well. Mm -hmm. And this suggests that CD44 part has the, capacity, uh, has the potential to activate the uh, hypoxia sensing pathway uh, either by inducing a pseudo hypoxia uh, uh, event or uh, further enhance the hypoxia response when cells are uh, in a hypoxic microenvironment. So um, just you know, make uh, uh, the long story short. You know, we've, uh, there's certainly you know, m multiple pathways are involved in the regulation of cell fate uh, in a macroenvironment, and uh, we, uh, yeah, I just talked about the CD44. We also have evidence that the epigenetic uh, pathways, especially the lysine, uh, histone lysine methyl transferase, are involved. Uh, uh, as well as the uh, PS3 kinase uh, AKT, that is a uh, uh, classically important pathway in regulating cell fate, uh, as well as other aspects of uh, cancer cell, uh, cell stimulus. All right, so uh, in the last few minutes, I just uh, uh, want to talk about uh, the impact of the hypoxia in vivo on tumor cells' uh, uh, sensitivity to different uh, therapeutic uh, interventions. And this is a... Uh, uh, a study that we did, we read the uh, uh, xenografts and uh, sort the uh, hypoxic cells out and look at their uh, cl uh, clonogenic potential survival uh, immediately after irradiation. 
so the, the, the conclusion that uh, as the whole population, the entire population in the hypoxic condition, the hypoxic cells have, uh, uh, have much better, uh, over twofold uh, higher survival against radiation. At a, uh, this is a two degree and, uh, and a, well, a 7.5 degree. And uh, uh, we're using another uh, uh, method, we can see that uh, the after irradiation, there's a significant e expansion of the previous uh, hypoxic uh, populations. This is the control, uh, uh, control is, uh, is down here. There's two different sites. And uh, uh, so, so th this, this data uh, suggests that the hypoxic uh, tumor cells were able to uh, survive the irradiation. This is in a high degree. Uh, it's almost uh, uh, able to bleed most of the tumor cells. Uh, and contribute to the regrowth uh, after uh, the irradiation. And uh, the uh, biologic basis for the radio resistance is that has something to do with the ability of this hypox previous or in vivo hypoxic tumor cells to effectively repair DNA damage. And we use a variety of uh, DNA uh, assays to assess DNA damage after this ionizing radiation in this case, and you can see that uh, the, the amount of damage it, uh, indicated by PV3, uh, BP foci, or, or gamma H2X foci decreased more rapidly uh, in the uh, uh, previous hypoxic tumor cells here, and indicating uh, more efficient repair. And this is another uh, assay to uh, assess uh, the degree of uh, uh, DNA, double strand DNA breaks and the, uh, the hypoxic, uh, uh, hypoxic uh, tumor cells. Uh, have much less uh, DNA breaks, and they were uh, able to uh, fix that uh, breaks more efficiently compared to the tumor cells uh, in a non uh, hypoxic compartment. And uh, the sim uh, similar uh, uh, results are, can be seen in, uh, when the cells were treated with other DNA damaging agents like, like bleomycin, etoposite, and the hypoxic cells were uh, ex vivo, or hypoxic cells were able to survive much better and they uh, have much better uh, ability to uh, repair the uh, damage, as uh, shown by the uh, decreased uh, PV3 B, uh, BP foci formation, and they have uh, lower sensitivity to uh, the drug-induced apoptosis, uh, shown by the PARP uh, cleavage. All right, so uh, again, the, the ability uh, uh, to resist DNA damage and uh, uh, and, uh, and survive against uh, uh, ionizing radiation uh, and other uh, DNA damaging agent has a lot to do with the ability of this hypoxic uh, tumor cells to sense uh, DNA damage as well as to repair. And th this is the classical uh, uh, DNA damage sensing pathway in, in a very simpl simplistic uh, fashion. And in, in response to DNA damage, there is a series of uh, phosphorylation events uh, starting with the phosphorylation of ATM, ATR, uh, followed by checkpoint kinase 1 or 2, uh, and then uh, uh, to the E factors such as PV3 and other uh, uh, proteins, uh, that, that eventually leads to the DNA uh, uh, repair and a restoration of the genome integrity. So as I highlighted here, as the highlight areas indicate the cells isolated from uh, the hypoxic uh, compartment in, the, in, in xenografts, and they all have very robust uh, uh, phosphorylation of these key uh, players within the DNA damage sensing pathway, indicating that uh, the hypoxic cell, uh, tumor cells localized in a hypoxic microenvironment are very proficient at, a, uh, at, a, uh, at sensing DNA damage uh, and also uh, uh, at repairing uh, the damage uh, as a result. Uh, I think I will. Okay. Uh, so I, I think in the end, uh, I just want to make two points. Hopefully, uh, that'll help you to convince you uh, or make you think about tumor hypoxia in your line of work uh, as well as in the clinics. And uh, so we certainly know that uh, hypoxia, uh, uh, in addition to posing a challenge to conventional radiation, uh, uh, ionizing radiation, 
but hypoxia in vivo uh, will drive cells to become more uh, stem cell-like through multiple pathways, uh, CD44 or, or epigenetic um, uh, pathways as well. And uh, uh, perhaps these changes uh, eventually uh, result in tumor cells acquiring more proficient, uh, higher proficiency at the DNA damage uh, response, as well as to repair potential DNA damage more effectively, uh, therefore survive the uh, 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 treatment uh, much more uh, effective. Right. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank all the people who did the work, especially uh, people in my lab. Uh, Hong Kim, Chun Lin did most of the work that I presented. Uh, and uh, uh, we also uh, have a long uh, standing uh, collaboration with Peter Glazer's group. And I showed some of the work by Chris, uh, uh, Sebastian Erk. Uh, and Ron Fan's group uh, uh, helped us with the uh, single cell analysis. And we also uh, benefited significantly from uh, the course of uh, YCC uh, for various analyses. And uh, also, uh, this work has been funded by uh, NCI, uh, City of Connecticut, uh, as well as uh, uh, the pilot grant from uh, the Cancer Center. And thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to take your questions. So are there any questions? Hey, thanks. That was very interesting. <clears throat> I'm trying to understand your stem cells, uh, your stem-like cells. Uh, do you think that these are cells which acquire stem-like features, perhaps epigenetically? And, and if so, why, when they get injected into a normoxic animal, don't they revert to less stem-like? I don't understand why they would still be more tumorigenic since these cells are plastic. I don't. Why do they keep these features, these stemmier features or more aggressive features once they're out of the hypoxic environment? Uh, that's a good, good question. Um, the short answer to, to that question is that uh, uh, the cells that we isolate from tumor in vivo, right, appear to undergo some sort of epigenetic changes that allow them to maintain their stamina for a period of time. Uh, just give you uh, some, 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 some numbers. Uh, Ex vivo, if we uh, grow the cells beyond 10 passages under higher oxygen conditions, the difference between the normo uh, non-hypoxic cells and the hypoxic cells ex vivo becomes diminished. But we can still see a uh, clear difference if we just maintain them for, let's say, uh, five to six passages. So there's a, there's a reversal, but it's a slow one. So that, I think that's a, also raised an important question that uh, you know, when the hypoxic cells manage to invade to non-hypoxic areas, you know, those characteristics or, or, or properties may still have a significant impact on how those n now uh, normoxic cells respond to therapy and, 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 and start new tumors. That's very interesting. Are there can you give us just your thoughts on what CD44 is doing when you're not in the hypoxic environment because a lot of cells are CD44 positive and they're bound to fibronectin and other parts of the extracellular matrix and they aren't stem cells. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, I think that, that part, I, we, we don't have a clear answer yet. I think uh, in the non hypoxic cells, the classical uh, way to actually, uh, activate CD44 pathway is through engagement of, of extracellular matri uh, matrix. But as you point out, they are constantly interacting with such molecules, right? And what are the triggers? I don't think that's very clear. And the uh, only thing that, that, that we know is that there's a, at least uh, two separate uh, cle azimatic cleavage, proteolytic cleavage events uh, that mm -hmm. leads to the full activation, or that is the release of the intracellular domain of CD44. And what's the trigger? That remains to be seen. But I think the, uh, what we found is under high-pass conditions, hypoxia appear to have the ability to bypass those conventional ways to activate this protein, to, but just cleave it and send it right to the nucleus. All right, thanks. I think we should move on. 